praise amen i'll kind of get into a little bit of scripture talking about that welcome if you're visiting here for the first time i am so glad you're here god is good amen amen god is so good okay i'm gonna go over a few things i know you guys have been looking at it on the screen up here but i just want to emphasize a few things max directory that's online um if you want an updated picture some of you need an updated picture. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, see Dave Totten or the information desk. That is going to be August 4th in the gazebo, correct? It's going to be in the gazebo in the park right over here unless it's raining, correct? Then it will be in here. So if you'd like to update that or be in that, um, talk to Dave or Jill in the back. Um, okay, Kids Sunday School. We got some really, really cool things going on with that. And Joa and Taylor have done an amazing job leading that up. Um, and I'm just gonna read this real quick. Kids Sunday School is gonna be at 9 a.m. for, for pre-K to, to five. Is it, is it five-year-old? Huh? Anyway, it's in your bulletin. Another thing, <laughs> another thing, there's bulletins in the back. Check, check that off because I'm ahead of myself. Um, we need teachers. We really need people. We need people to serve if it's at all. Just a little bit on your heart. Just a skosh on your heart to serve with kids. We need you. We can really, really, we really need the help. So I just want to stress that that if that's something that you would like to do or be a part of or serve in, 
please talk to Joa or Taylor, and they will line you out, they will put you where they need you, and they will get you busy, and it will be such a blessing to just love on these kids. So, um, youth group, uh, we'll start back up this Wednesday. We'll be talking about that. That's um, starting at 630 um, next Saturday, we've got Iowa Cubs game, and there's a few guys signed up back there. If you're interested in going to that, there's a sign-up sheet at the information desk where Jill is sitting. Everybody turn around and say, hi, Jill. I love you, Jill. Um, so go back there. Please sign up. Leaving the church at 430. Game starts at 6 o'clock, so be ready for that. Mark Young, if you've not had a chance to listen to Mark Young, what a man of God. He's doing some awesome things for the Lord in the Philippines. He will be here next Sunday. You don't want to miss it. This church supports this man. So your giving that you give to this church will support him. And it's such a blessing to have someone that we support, that we give to, that we love on, be able to come in and share what he's doing, rather than sometimes we're not for sure what's going on, but he's going to actually be here and share with you um, what's going on and there's a lot of stuff really cool God things going on in the Philippines right now so uh, be ready for that there's a letter from the elders it's a back at the information desk if you'd like to read that uh, by paper form you can pick that up back there um, again there's also bulletins back there if you want a paper copy of the bulletin pies we have pies a lot of pies. Strawberry rhubarb, okay, it's summer, people. That's a delicious pie. Stick that right in your oven. You got yourself a nice pie. 20 bucks, come see me. I'll get you a pie. We have pies. And I think we've got a few of the other flavors too. So um, if you're interested in that, those are still for sale. We have them on hand. So if you're thinking right now, hey, I've got a bunch of family coming over today. We got pie. Yeah, I mean, there's your dessert. So, uh, so there's that little uh, the youth went on a canoe trip this last week and man my heart swelled um, but at the same same time deflated because I couldn't be there and I so wanted to be and um, the leaders Ashley Dylan and Tyler did such a wonderful job leading this youth I hear they all came back with bug bites any bug bites I mean that just comes with the territory and low sleep are you guys rested up not at all Dylan says no okay so anyway God is good no matter what and I want to read Matthew 18 verse 20 it says for where two or three have gathered together in my name this is in red letters it says I am there in their midst you would stand with me. We're going to get ready to worship again. And I want to pray. We need to understand and realize that he's here. I think sometimes we kind of overlook that a little bit and we read. Who's here? Who's guilty of reading the word of God? And sometimes you skip over stuff and you're like, then you go back and you read it again. You're like, oh, and this morning, or actually yesterday, as I was praying, for you guys as I was praying for what he wanted me to share. Verse 20 came up in Matthew 18, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in, I am there in their midst. He is here today because we're gathered together to glorify him. Can I get an amen? What an honor. What an honor to have him here in our midst to have him here dwelling with us and the Holy Spirit flowing in this place and wanting to move. Man, no matter how your week has been, and I know I say that every week and you're probably like, I bet she's gonna say that this week. No matter how your week has been, he wants to meet with you this morning. He wants to love on you. He wants to wrap his arms around you. He says, he says relax, I want you to lean back on me and I want you to, Hear my heartbeat, and I want to show you how much I love you. Another thing I want to talk about, we're getting a pretty full class downstairs um, on Sunday mornings. Mike Schmidt leads that class. The Holy Spirit leads that class. 
but Mike Schmidt leads that class, and I'm telling you what, if you need something more, if you need to go a little deeper, if you need other men and women in your life speaking into your life, if you have something on your heart that you want to speak into other people's hearts, please come to this class. I'm telling you. I heard Rich Mabe, the way he spoke this morning about how we all were being fed. And I was so agreeing with him how I was so fed this morning. And yes, it's so good to come in here. Man, Neil is going to be preaching this morning. I'm looking forward to that. But when you sit down in a class all together and you're in the Word of God and you're bouncing ideas out there and you're sharing your heart of what that scripture means to you and then somebody comes, somebody else comes in, Dennis Thompson comes in and shares his heart about something and you just start gathering all of this in and your heart becomes so full. And I want to encourage you, if you want to go deeper, you want to get closer, that's what the Word of God does. I want to encourage you, come to this class. And yes, it could get very big, but you know what? More the merrier. What a beautiful thing. So I want to pray. Father, we love you. We know you're here this morning. That it shouldn't, but sometimes that boggles my mind, Father, that you're here, you're in our midst, that you're speaking to our hearts, that you love us so much that you would say, I'm here with you. No matter the week you've been through, no matter the struggle, no matter that mountaintop, no matter where you have been in your life this week, I am going to meet with you because I love you. He says, I love you. He says, I love you so much that I gave my life for you. The ultimate sacrifice was made for you and me. And we're so thankful for that, Father. I pray for Brother Neil. I pray as he gets up here that you would speak right through him, that you would touch hearts, that your spirit would flow, that you would prepare us for the week ahead to be able to love on others, that we would be fervent in love, that we would have a fervency about us. But Father, we love you. You're so welcome in this place. This name. And everybody said, Amen.
Good morning, church. It's great to see you again. Great to be back here. It's been a uh, it's been a while. It's been a minute since I was here. Maybe uh, even a few months. I know uh, a lot's happened over the last few months. I survived a, a shoulder surgery. I'm uh, feeling much better. I got a lot of range of motion going on here. I probably won't be throwing any touchdown passes anytime soon. But uh, I'm on the road. I'm on the road to recovery. So, yeah, praise God on that one. Um, what else? I, I, I am really happy to be back here. Um, uh, Michelle and I have said since we since the first time we came up here, uh, it just feels like home at this church. So it's just great. It's great to be back here um, and to be with you today. And uh, plus, you always have pie. I mean, every time I come, there's pie. I'm like, wow, this is a church after my heart. I love some good pie. Uh, today, I get to talk about uh, a story that's always just really captured my my uh, imagination, I think, uh, spoke to my spirit. Um, it really is a, um, it's a cool story, uh, kind of deep in the, in the book of Ezekiel. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about, about dry bones. And um, I'll start out just by uh, talking a little bit about Ezekiel, right? Because Ezekiel is one of, four, one of the four major prophets in the Old Testament. You have Isaiah, you have Jeremiah, you have Ezekiel, and you have Daniel, right? And then there's 12 minor prophets, they call them. Their books are kind of short. Um, they follow uh, uh, Daniel. Um, I could name them for you, but uh, uh, I probably wouldn't get them in the right order, or uh, it would take me a while, but uh, there's 12 of them. Um, Ezekiel was kind of a, a cool prophet. Uh, at least he got to see God in different kind of um, really wild ways. Um, his prophecies are very vivid and they're very um, just kind of almost out there a little bit. But Ezekiel, what we know about him was one, he was a really, really intelligent guy. We can tell by his writings. And he had a really broad knowledge of, of everything that was is, is Israeli and, and uh, Babylonian. He was actually exiled to Babylon uh, in the year five. Uh, what is it, 586 B.C. Um, I'm sorry, 597 B.C., I'm confusing a couple. Um, he, was, he was sent to Babylon where he, was, uh, he, he made his life. We know that he owned a home and he got to live a pretty free life. We know that he was married at one point but later lost his wife uh, to death. Um, we also know that he wrote with, with great precision in his dates. So that's kind of who Ezekiel is uh, in a nutshell. Um, I also want to start with a little context about where we are in the Bible when, when, when Ezekiel writes his prophecy. Um, this is going to sound really familiar to you probably. Um, one thing that happens to me often when I, I, I get to come speak is usually the message that God puts on my heart or that he gives me to talk about is something that speaks to me personally more than just about anything. And so I always learn more about life when I do this than I think people do when I get up and talk. Um, and this time is no different. This is going to be really similar, actually, to uh, something I talked about months ago when we were in the book of Jeremiah. Um, he has to speak to me multiple times a lot because I'm a slow learner. So if there's some similarities here, you might pick up on, uh, it's going to be this. Where we find ourselves in the text today is Ezekiel is prophesying to, the, to the, uh, the Israel nation, right? Just like Jeremiah, just like Isaiah, he's prophesying, telling him, look, you guys are sideways with God, okay? You need to turn your ways. God is going to come in and blow this up if we don't start living our lives following him. And, of course, Israel, they don't pay attention at all. We know that um, later in 597 B.C., I'm sorry, 586 B.C., um, God delivers on his promise. He delivers on the prophecies that Israel is, is not going to come around. And the army of Babylon comes in, um, sacks the city of Jerusalem, basically tears down their walls, raises the temple, and sends most of Jerusalem into exile in Babylon. You might remember that from, from the book of Jeremiah. Um, we covered Jeremiah 29, 11, 
where it says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for to prosper, uh, plans to give you a good life. And what we see is um, that's, that's kind of a foreshadowing of what's ahead. But the Israelites were called, they were going to spend 70 years in captivity in Babylon, right? And some people remained back in Jerusalem, but the ones that did, they didn't have it much better, okay? They were destitute. Things were horrible. Their lives were just shambles. And this is really a representation of what happens when Israel got cut off from God, right? When they had turned their backs completely on God and they're separated, this was the result. So that's kind of the context, you know? Not only did they get sideways, they got really sideways with God and they were completely cut off. So I want to read the text today of Ezekiel 37. It starts like this in verse 1. The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me along, around, among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere, across the ground, and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, You alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message, just as he told me. And suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. The skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message To the wind, son of man, speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Come into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life, stood up on their feet. It was a great army. And so for me, man, that that imagery, that, uh, my imagination just takes over when I think of that. Um, there's a few things that stand out at me when we hear that. One is that uh, when we're looking at in this valley, right, we're in a valley, and Ezekiel looks around, and he's going to and fro, so there's bones everywhere. So there's lots of bones, like an army of bones. And what we know is they were dry. In fact, not just dry, it says they were completely dried out, okay? They were completely very, very dry. And that is symbolism for how our lives can become when we're detached from God. Israel got detached, and the result was they were complete skeletons. There was no life in them. Very, very dry. The other thing is, when I used to read this as as maybe just a lot younger person, I didn't really, for some reason, I had this imagery that um, the bones were like animal bones or something. You know, they were, they were like mammoth type bones. I don't even know why, but it was just something that was in my mind. And then I realized, you know, over time that these, these are human bones, right? These are people. This, this is the, the, the nation of Israel. And so when we look at this, there's lots of bones, there's human bones, and they're everywhere. Super dry. And then he says to Ezekiel, he says, Son of man, can these bones live again? And I love his response. Zeke's like, um, I don't know, God. Only you know, right? Because I bet he was looking at these bones thinking to himself, Heck no, there's no way these bones are going to live again. I know that's what I would have been thinking. I know I like to, I do a lot of uh, bow hunting deer in the fall, 
right? As you walk through the forest, sometimes you'll see, you'll find like a, a critter or something who's, you know, died a long time ago, and you'll find a skeleton, okay? And I just imagine, like, if I, if I was out in the woods this fall and I saw that, and it occurred to me, could this thing live again? I know what my response would be. It'd be, no way. There's no way that could happen. But what, what Zeke says is, uh, Ezekiel, I'll probably meet um, Ezekiel in heaven, and he'll be like, don't ever call me Zeke again. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Ezekiel says, I don't know, but God, you know. Because Ezekiel knew that with God, anything is possible, right? Anything is possible with God. So he wasn't about to say no way. Even though his, his, his human knowledge, his, his conscience probably was like, yeah, these, these bones are dead. Um, he knew that with God, all things are possible. When we look at the, what happens next in Ezekiel's prophecy is he spends the first 20-some chapters of his book prophesying to Israel and other nations of their demise. But then it turns, just like it turns in Jeremiah, to a message of hope and restoration. And we know that that happens because 70 years later, we know that they return from exile to Jerusalem. We know in the book of uh, Nehemiah that the wall gets restored and rebuilt around Jerusalem. We know in Ezra that the temple is rebuilt, right? So we know what happens. But God's message of restoration is, is this, to give them a hope and a future. But if you look at, ch- at verse 7, it says, So I spoke this message just as, as he told me. Suddenly I spoke and there was a rattling noise across the valley. I mean, think of that, just that, that imagery in itself, just being able to hear those bones moving and coming together. And then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Skin formed to cover their bodies. So he sees this. He sees a restoration. And this is, again, foreshadowing that the the body of Israel would be brought up and restored. So there's hope and there's there's, there's, um, trust in that. But that wasn't it. Right? It's kind of like in the story of, of Adam in Genesis 2. When God made Adam, first he created the body, right? But that wasn't it. What happens next is so important. God says to Ezekiel, prophesy, son of man, and, and call in breath from the four winds, right? And the, the word for breath there in the Hebrew in chapters, in, in verse 7, is ruach. It's a funny word to say, and it sounds like you're like going to hack something up, a ruach. But that word in Hebrew is spirit, okay? And it's the breath of God's spirit entering the bones, entering the bodies, entering Adam that brings life, that brings true life, real spiritual life. It's God's breath, right? It's God's spirit coming into him that, that ignites. And then after that, they rise to their feet, and they become an army. Again, it just, it just shows us that without God, we can't do anything, okay? Cut off for him, we're like dry bones. Um, <clears throat> Israel knew it, and they proved it in their, in their walk. Um, I think this story is so cool and so um, applicable And I love to look at what it means for us in our lives today. And when I think about that, there's three things I think of. One is, I really think sometimes in our personal faith, in our relationship with God, we can become like dry bones, right? We can can get into a spot where, man, we're just not feeling it, right? Maybe we're a little dry. Maybe things have gotten dusty in our faith. Maybe we're like a sponge, like it hasn't been immersed in water for a while, and it's kind of dry and crusty. Things are hard. Maybe sometimes the Bible feels like a 1,000 pounds. You know, sometimes it's just hard to pray, to find the words. Um, And sometimes it's just we get distracted. And sometimes we need God, that breath. We need that ruach back in our spiritual lives to help us along. Um, there's a couple things that happened during this time, and I want to just hit on them real quick. These actually occurred to me last night in bed in the middle of the night. But 
One thing I think we really have to be f- focused on and uh, aware of is, is we shouldn't depend on our feelings as much as we should depend on the facts of what the Bible says, okay? It should always be facts over feelings. Because here's the thing about our spiritual walk. If we depend on our feelings, things change all the time. We can have different feelings based on what we had for breakfast. Whether we ate well, we didn't. Whether we got enough sleep or whether we didn't. And I'm an emotional guy. I, I, am, I wear my emotions on my sleeve most of the time. And there's so many times when I'm, just, I, I'm thinking to myself, I don't feel God. I don't, I don't feel him. And that's easy for the enemy to come in and, and put lies in our heads, put lies in our minds. One, one of them, the big one is um, God has left you. Um, I like to keep it real, so I'm just going to share mine right here. The, um, I, I, I sometimes feel like God's left you. Man, he's gone. You're on your own. And um, I feel that way because I don't see God moving. I have a hard time with prayer. I don't think I'm doing enough. I'm not disciplined enough. Um, and so I feel, I feel alone sometimes. But then we go to the facts, right? We go to the Bible and his word, and we know that he says, I will never leave or forsake you, right? His promise is to love us forever and not leave our side. So we have to hang on to those facts, not how we're feeling. And so when you're starting to feel a little funky, like, wow, I think God's gone, no way. No way, never. You go back to the Bible and hang on the facts of what he says. The other thing that trips me up, and this is ironic, is um, sometimes I'm like, I don't think God loves me. Man. Uh, It's ironic, I think, because my job for the last 15 years has been to go around and tell people and kids how much God loves them. told you that emotional thing it gets me all the time anyway um it was ironic because my job is to go around and tell people how much god loves them and sometimes i'd be like oh man i don't know that god loves me uh and that was really a hard thing for me for a long time and then um some things happen again you go back to the facts you go back to the word and you see where god says i love in uh One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Romans 8. I love it so much, it comes right out of my Bible. Um, But but in in verse 38 of chapter 8, it says, It says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And so those those promises, again, are so important for us to hang on to. Uh, I was in a Bible study with a few guys, uh, this is quite a few years ago, but I expressed this, this issue to them and uh, they were like, Neil, you, you have daughters, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you lo- I know how much you love them. You, you love them, right? I'm like, more than anything. And he's like, how would you feel if they, they questioned if you loved them, you or not? You know, how would you feel if they thought, well, yeah, I don't think my dad loves me? And I was like, oh, man, I feel terrible. And I realized that's probably how God feels when we question his love for us. And so it reframed that issue into a way that now I kind of own that. And I don't ever have to doubt that again. So, again, facts over feelings. It's just so important in our walk that we don't get sidetracked by how we feel. Because it's not always true. Okay? The next thing is um, we can get tripped up in our faith, I think, if we try to go this thing alone. I say a lot of times, I don't think Christianity is a solo sport. It's not really a sport, but it's not a thing we do on our own. And I didn't always know that either. I thought, well, I can sit home. I can read my Bible. I can, like, learn about God. I can be faithful. I can praise God. I can worship. And I can do that all in my living room. But the thing is, is we're created to be in community. 
And when we're alone and isolated, we can get in trouble. So it's important to be part of something bigger. I mean, Aaron was talking about the small group, the, the Sunday school that meets. I mean, what a fantastic way to get connected and to have your faith uh, edified and lifted up. Okay? So, so maybe it's that. Maybe it's a small group meeting. For years, I had two guys I met with every Friday at a coffee shop. Years and years. And then they both moved away and we just kind of, it ran its course. But man, when you're connected with other believers... I know in his, uh, Ecclesiastes, some, Ecclesiastes somewhere it says uh, a triple braided cord is, is hard to break, right? One person alone is in a lot of trouble. Two people, we can help each other stand, but three. And I, I just, this is just coming to me. When I was a finance guy and I was doing a lot of personal finance, I had a buddy, his name's Denny, and I, I used this illustration all the time with him. Uh, I'd hand him a pencil and say, hey, can you break that pencil? And he'd be like, oh, yeah, easy. You know, you can break that pencil. Then if you hand him a, 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 a wad of like 40 pencils, rubber band together, and I said, can you break this? Oh, no. That just goes to show how much stronger we are in numbers. Okay? So hopefully that's something you can take and you'll remember. He brings that up all the time for some reason. But, uh, but, but that's another good illustration that we're better together. So if there's anybody watching at home, I would invite you. Come back. Come back to the church. Because we are better together. We're alone, man, we're just easy pickings for the enemy, right? We're, we're meant to do this together. We're, mo- we're meant to experience faith together with others. And so it's so important that we, 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 we embrace that. And uh, trust me, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy who likes to be alone. Uh, I can hang out in my home 100% of the time and, and be pretty content. But that's not how we're designed. And that's not God's plan for us. Uh, the next thing, number two on the list, is um, first was our personal faith and relationship with God. Second, I would say, is our lives, okay? The things going on in our lives. Sometimes we look at things in our lives and we see bones, right? We see a valley of bones. And I don't believe it's any mistake that, that, that Ezekiel and the, the, the way the Lord spoke to him used the word valley, okay? Because what's a valley? It's a low place, Right? And back in those days, a valley would have been a dangerous place because you're down low. You could easily be taken um, by surprise from somebody on higher ground. So valley is a dark and troubling space sometimes. But I've always said that I don't believe our faith has grown on the mountaintop. I think our faith has grown most in the valley when things are hard, you know, when life is not looking so good. That's when our faith has truly grown. You know, we get mountaintop experiences, and I think those are so important And they're so good to remember because when you're in the valley, it's awesome to be able to look back and be ready to say, I remember God did that. He'll do it again. But I don't think we're wired up to spend our whole time on the mountaintop. We have to go through valleys, and that's when we usually come out on the other side of the valley better, closer, stronger. Right? Even Romans 5, 3 is coming to mind where where Paul writes, um, we should be thankful for our, our, our um, troubles because troubles build character. They build per- perseverance. That's a hard thing to know when you're going through it, but it's still true. We can look at our lives and we see things that, that are, are like dry bones. I, I'm looking at, uh, I think last time I was with you, I was you know, kind of teetering on what was going to happen with ministry. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of there. I'm still trying to figure out where God is leading me where God is leading me in my, my finances and, and my vocation in ministry. And a lot of it, honestly, looks like very dry bones. And so I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to be strong, I'm trying to persevere, um, and I wish I did it better. But that's where faith is being built. That's where faith is being refined, I think. And uh, I don't know. You know Paul wrote in uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I used to love that because I thought, oh, I can do all things. But he wrote that from prison, right? And things weren't going good for Paul. But he said, no matter how good they are or how bad they are, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And so with him, we're great. When we have the Ruach, we're good. But it doesn't mean things are always mountaintop. There'll be valley times. The last thing, and this is the best thing, is we see restoration, hope, renewal, 
and salvation, right? Jesus came to earth and became dry bones for us. When he went on the cross and took the weight of all the sin of man and was completely cut off from God, that he was dry bones. But did he stay there? No, we know he didn't stay dry bones. God came in and resurrected him, lifted him from dead, right? To live today and be our savior. And it's through faith in Jesus Christ that we know when we face the ultimate dry bones, when we, when we die on this earth, that he is there. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's the beginning of heaven and eternity with God. And so all these troubles today, all these things we face today will be nothing compared to the glory of, of heaven. And so we have that hope and we can know that someday our bodies will be restored. You know, these bodies that break down and these things that happen and this, this uh, disappointment and things like that someday will be completely washed away, right? And it's through faith in him. We don't have to earn it. We, don't even, we, we, we get it because of God's grace, right? God loves us so much that he gives us this gift of his son and his death and resurrec- resurrection on the cross, so I like to tell people a long time, a lot of the time, look, there's not a ladder we have to climb to get to heaven. Jesus came down the ladder, right, to save us where we are. Not one of us measures up. None of us are getting into heaven based on our own merit and works and serving. We aren't going to read the Bible enough or pray enough to get into heaven. It's only because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that we through grace, get to come. So, in in conclusion, I would just say, anybody at any time can accept this restoration, this, this, this gift from God, his son, Jesus Christ, right? Anybody can come, and no matter how broken, no matter how dry your bones seem, he'll lift you up. He can make you new, brand new skin, brand new flesh, brand new spirit. And that waits for anybody who wants to claim it. So again, if there's people there on, on, on you know, watching on video here today, you know, I would invite you just to, to, to check, look, in, you know, look into it. You know, accept this gift, gift from God of Jesus. It'll change your life. It'll change your destiny. It'll change your eternity. And there's nothing better. There's nothing better than when God lifts you up and gives you that breath of, of it's just so amazing. It's just so pure and true. And it's so good. And it's just, um, it's what life is all about. So God is a God of hope and restoration and renewal and revival. And I pray we all can just experience that uh, in new and just exciting ways. So let's close with a prayer. Uh, Father God, I just thank you so much for um, the way your, your, um, your word uh, gives us assurance, God, and, and the facts that are laid out um, so that we know your heart for us and we know we can trust you. And God, we know that you love us. Um, Father, when I read this story, I'm just filled with hope. And uh, as we look around, sometimes, God, it looks like there's a lot of dry bones and we're in the valley. Um, I'm praying, Father, that uh, through your renewal and, and restoration, we can step out of that and uh, grow as, as people in faith. Um, and we just look forward to your, your blessings, your renewal, um, your, your spirit, your breath of hope. Um, Father, I pray that this week um, you know, we can hear rattling of bones and, and see flesh being restored and know that uh, you're working on our behalf. Um, and we just reminded God of, of Romans 8.31 where it says, you, uh, uh, if God is for you, who can be against you? So uh, uh, we claim that now, God. We lift these things up to you. We come to you um, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you stand and join us for the closing song.
Good word. And God loves you, man. I see the emotion in you and how much you love him. But I want to tell you this. He's right there. He's right there for you, with you, and with your family. Amen? God is good. Feeling dry? Have you ever felt dry? I have. One good thing about standing up here is, as Neil was speaking, I get to kind of thumb through and look at some of the scripture that speaks to me while the preacher is speaking. And I want to share that with you. John 15, 12 says this. And if you're dry this morning, I want you to listen. Because what I'm about to read will make you not dry anymore. And what I'm about to read does not just include me or us, it includes us loving somebody else. So, we're going to talk about first, I got some red letters I want to read here. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. He died for you and he died for me. We have life. I am no longer dry. Can I get an amen? amen? That's exciting. I am no longer dry. The valley that I was in, the dry bones that I was a part of have now come to life because of what he did for me and for us. Amen? amen. Now, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you slaves. Amen? Come on, this is exciting. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I've made known to you. I am no longer dry. And I sure can't sit in this pew and say that I'm dry. Because I have no reason to be dry. Because he's given me life. I'm jumping up out of that valley, baby. And I want to tell you right now, if you're in the valley and you're dry, rise up. Because he's speaking right to you through Neil. Sorry for the second message. <laughs> you did not choose me, but I chose you. I'm not dry. Neil, you're not dry, brother. And appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. Now we have a response. Now that I came up out of that valley, it's my response to go back down into the valley and speak life into the dry bones. Wherever that's at in your life, maybe that's your workplace, maybe it's in the schools, who knows, wherever that is, in the grocery store. In your car when you get mad at the other driver, wherever that is, man, you got the right to go in that valley in Jesus' name and speak life into that valley. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. This I command you, that you love one another. We have no reason to be dry. 
He has spoken to us. You have life because of him. And now because he's spoken life into our dry bones and that we came alive, now we have every responsibility and the honor to go back down into that valley and speak life to the dry bones that are all around us. Amen? So as we walk out these doors, you're going to walk into a valley of dry bones. (laughs) Oh, buddy. They're going to be dry and stinky. And we have every opportunity, just like he spoke to our life, just like he spoke to our dry bones, we have every opportunity to speak that to everybody else around us. Father, we love you. Father, I pray that you would help us be the one that speaks to the dry bones in Jesus' name. Help us be the encouragement, the love, the ministry, the fervency that you were to us because you said in your word that you chose us. You call us friend. You tell us that we're no longer a slave. You tell us that we're no longer dry. So Father, help us to spread that message as we walk out into the mission field this week. And that can be tough. But God, we ask that your spirit would flow through us and speak through us. And that you would speak in such a way that people cannot ignore what we're saying in your name. Father, we love you. As we dismiss from this place, may we never dismiss from your presence. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.